Living Clean, Living Well is a presentation of the Canadian Center for Abuse Awareness and is brought to you by Freedom From Addiction. Welcome everyone. Tonight on Living Clean, Living Well, a brave and profound journey of recovery with a note of caution for many. Our guest tonight is a journalist, she is a speaker, she is the best-selling author and award-winning writer of Drink, the intimate relationship between women and alcohol. Would you please welcome to our show Anne Dowsett Johnson. Anne, it is wonderful to see you tonight. Hello. Thank you for having me. You bet. Good to see you. And Dr. Vera Tarman, it's good to have you back in the house. Thank you. <laughs> Always glad to be back. You bet. Well, before we launch into uh, the, the look at, at your wonderful book, it's also been featured in uh, one of our major newspapers. Um, it's a, it's a, a fabulous um, uh, story and, like I said, a, a note of caution for many. Before we launch into this, I just wanted to talk generally with you. Um, you know, it's it's been a bit of a rough fall, so we really hope that tonight, wherever you are watching this show, that uh, you're out of the weather. Um, it's a very dark and stormy night here in southern Ontario, so we hope that you folks are, are fine. And as well, all my relatives, a shout out to my mom out west. It seems like everybody's been hammered by snow. Mom had a blizzard, uh, all my relatives out in Calgary. So uh, we hope wherever you are tonight that you're warm, that you're safe, and like I said, that you're tucked in and uh, able to watch our show tonight. So how was your drive-in, ladies, uh, through this wild uh, storm that we've been having? Well, it was pretty scary for about 15 minutes. <laughs> it was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. I, had, I had a longer journey, so uh, yeah. mine was about 45 minutes of white knuckle, and then it seemed to taper down. It's, it's like the storm's coming in waves. Yeah. And of course, the same storm pattern that caused all those tornadoes down mm -hmm. in the United States. Right. So my goodness, I guess we can take a little bit of wind and rain, right? Yeah. So anyway, a dark and stormy night, but we are here. We are here at Living Clean, Living Well. And Anne, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your book and your journey. Um, but before we do that, Dr. Dr. Vera Tarman, uh, you just came back from Austria. I did. Yeah, how was yes, that? I did. Oh my God, Austria was beautiful. If you like mountains, um, well, I mean, how can you not like mountains? Yeah. I mean, I did mountain climbing. It was it was wonderful weather. Just absolutely gorgeous. And how much yodeling did you do? Uh, I didn't need to yodel. You didn't. Know. <laughs> 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 just I felt like yeah, yeah, it was just wonderful. Oh, that's great. Well, it's good to have you back. Yeah, thank you. So, Anne, tell me a little bit about what was the impetus of writing your your book, Drink. Um, the impetus was very personal. Um, I grew up with an alcoholic mother who uh, was cross-addicted to Valium and cocktails, stay-at-home mom, a wonderful woman mm -hmm. with whom I'm very close, and she had a very long addiction. I was the eldest daughter and very, very troubled and confused about addiction from the time I was very young. Mm -hmm. It was the one place I knew I would never go, and then in my 50s, I joined her as a very different kind of alcoholic. Um, and that puzzle, the puzzle of addiction, really was front and center in my brain. And so this book was an opportunity to wrestle with it. Mm -hmm. So even though it is written for women, you were telling me that you have had some men that have read it. And what was their reaction to the book? Men, men love this book. I mean, I think that, that if you wrestle with addiction yourself, that this book is written, um, talks about many things that affect both men and women. Um, I look at the gender piece, um, the, the closing gender gap on women and drinking, but frankly, women are just catching up to men. Men have been there for a while, so it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. Dr. Charman, I see you nodding your head. Uh, what's been your reaction to the book? Um, well, I, I, I read the book. I found it very um, interesting. I, I really like the book because I see so many young women in my workplace who um, don't have any anything that they can relate to and I tell them about this book saying this book was written for you I mean it's certainly it's written for other people as well but it, it speaks so well their language um, uh, in a way that I haven't seen before mm -hmm. yeah so Anne, let's let's start back at the beginning why don't you tell us a little bit about your story I know when I it was uh, serialized in the Toronto Star there right. was a series of, of dailies uh, articles that that I read as well mm -hmm. uh, were you in other publications yes all I over the so. world so it's so. it's really exciting the books come out yeah. across North America Australia and the UK and it's had a lot of a lot of response everywhere which is thrilling 
Um, the book is, is very naked, very vulnerable. I decided mm -hmm. uh, when I was at the Star, I was writing a 14-part series on women and alcohol for my Atkinson Fellowship. I was going to say it was your fellowship, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and that was the genesis. And my editor very kindly said, mm -hmm. I said, shall I share my story? And she said, do you need to work? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, you can't. The stigma is too great. So this was my way, finally, of bringing pen to paper on my own story, telling my story, my memoir mm -hmm. of having trouble with alcohol, mm -hmm. and the stories of many, many other women. Could we back up just a little bit? Um, do you need to work? The stigma is too great. Could you explain that? Where was she going? Right. Um, her feeling was, if I outed myself as an alcoholic mm -hmm. in recovery, didn't matter, I would never work again. Really? Yes. And I think As a that, journalist? As a journalist. And I think as we mm. have seen some really great inroads on um, the stigma, working on the stigma related to mental health, I don't think that we have, have seen the same kind of efforts on addiction, which is why... I'm part of Faces and Voices of Recovery, and I know that you're well versed in this. But really, this was a big step for me. I was um, an award-winning journalist, five gold national magazine awards, wow. former vice principal of McGill. Um, I had a great career. And when I fell uh, into addiction, I hid. I took two years off. I stayed close to home. I went to treatment in the United States. I kept my story very, very quiet, and I could have kept it quiet, um, but I chose not to. I chose to come out and uh, mm. I hope be one of the people that leads the way to fight the stigma around addiction. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed the the early days, uh, um, you know, of, of going up to the cottage, mm. and you know, there's. Some beautiful, charming parts of this book and uh, warm and lovely, but I think that's where you started to paint the picture of, of mom's uh, problems. Is, is, am I right in saying right. that? Right. Yeah. Right. And tell, tell, tell the folks a little bit about that. Well, um, my mother was a very beautiful young woman with uh, three children, um, and it was the six, 50s and 60s, and at that point when you had a husband in mining, as my father was, your husband would leave for uh, nine months straight and not be sent home. And so mom was very isolated, suffered from depression, um, definitely drank, and fell um, under the spell of Valium at the same time, which was very complex. Mm -hmm. And okay. cross-addiction is, is uh, not pretty. It was not pretty. And it was an evolving, devolving story that went on for many decades. I... Um, I fell into workaholism, and so that was my ism for many years, and it served me very well. It served me well in my career, served me well in many ways, and kept me very happy. It was an addiction I loved. Um, and then in menopause, um, in my 50s, I suffered huge depression, empty nest syndrome, and also moved to Montreal to be vice principal of McGill, mm. all of a sudden taking on an enormous job with 190 employees responding to me or in my department. And it was a very challenging time, very lonely time in my life. Mm. Uh, and my two or three glasses of wine changed to three or four glasses of wine which became five which sent me to treatment. I was what they call a very high bottom drunk. Yeah, explain that phrase, the high bottom. I didn't miss work. I didn't crack up a car. I didn't ruin my personal relationships. Um, that's opposed to low bottom, the person who does just that. The, we think of the man who sits under the bridge with a brown paper bag and a bottle, and that's a low bottom drunk, um, homeless. Uh, I was very high bottom, high functioning, very high functioning, and uh, until I was not. And one day I got a phone call saying that my cousin, my closest friend from childhood, had been killed by a drunk driver. Mm -hmm. And I sat down that Sunday morning, it was Father's Day, and said, what else do I need to lose to alcohol? Yeah. Lost my childhood, losing myself. Mm -hmm. Better do something. Did you have any family members noticing that there might have been something a bit off? Yes. Mm -hmm. my, I had two people call me on my drinking. Mm -hmm. um, my son who was then away at university, and my partner, Jake. And they were um, vocal, very vocal, about saying, you have to do something. 
And unlike my childhood, where we weren't allowed to talk about addiction, we, it was the elephant in the living room. We were never allowed to um, speak up. I vowed that I would always answer with a yes. And so when I, they said, your drinking's out of hand, I'd say, yes, it is. And that was my savior, really, was getting help before I fell further down the bunny hole. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very fortunate. We often get questions, uh, viewers call into the show, and they're not sure if they have an issue. So, you know, if, if, if your body gets used to alcohol and it's okay and it's operating, you said you were highly functional, so five drinks, you've, you're having the wine. Were there incidents that your family were concerned about? Or, like, I'm wondering if this might help other viewers sure. to, to understand that, you know, that line that when you've crossed over it and, and it is now time to say, you know, you, you've got to stop it. So, right. could you describe that for yourself? Yeah, the two things that happened for me is I was definitely drinking to numb. Mm -hmm. I was definitely drinking to numb depression, no doubt about it. I was drinking to go to sleep, to stay awake. I was using it for any reason I could. Did you drink during the day? Never. No, so only at night. Only at night and only very, quite hidden. The other thing that started happening was I um, made a promise to myself. I would only drink one glass of wine or I wouldn't drink any and I kept a diary and I found I couldn't keep my promises mm -hmm. and I, my drinking diary told a tough story and I began to black, black out, black out on a regular basis. Um, my spiral downwards was about 17 months and 18 months, not that long and people find that a little hard to believe but it was quite dramatic and it was connected to, to menopause, I really believe that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I blew the whistle on myself, went to rehab, but wasn't able to, to stay sober even after rehab. I had many slips. So it took me about a year to get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm now five years sober, which is, which is um, mm -hmm. something that brings me a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. it, recovery isn't for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No. So we've been learning. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Charmin, your thoughts on menopause and possibly uh, leading to expose more, more issues with the alcohol? Oh, I think, yeah, we were talking about, that's one of the things we were talking about uh, earlier. Uh, I think that menopause is, for women, uh, a major cri uh, point of crisis. The hormonal upset, I mean, you just think about what it's like when you're an adolescent. I, I don't think we give enough credence to uh, the hormonal upset that happens for women insomnia, rage, irritability, depression, uh, and, and you know, we're, we're living in a culture where it's not acknowledged really. I mean, yes, we pay attention to the hot flashes, but mm -hmm. that whole mood piece is a, a really big piece, mm -hmm. and a lot of women talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tonight we're talking to Dr. Vera Tarman and also Anne Dowsett Johnson. She is the best-selling author of Drink, an intimate relationship between women and alcohol, but her message is for everyone. So we are going to take our first break here on the show, but when we come back, we're going to take some more, some phone calls from you, and also we're going to hear more from Anne and Dr. Tarman. We'll be right back. It's scary to think that you're going to live the rest of your life without drugs and alcohol when it's all you've depended on. But there is hope. I knew I couldn't do it alone. And treatment allowed me the chance to ask for the help that I needed in order to believe that I could live a sober life. I got the help and support that I needed and even now that I've left, I still have that support there. Welcome back to Living Clean, Living Well, everybody. I'm your host, Teresa Cruz. And as you heard just before the break, our special guest tonight is Anne Dowsett Johnson. She is the writer of a, of a new book that uh, talks about her story and some of the things that she has learned. It's called Drink, the Intimate Relationship Between Women and Alcohol. It has been released around the world, and it is a bestseller, as I mentioned. And it has been highly acclaimed, 
and it is great to have Anne on our show tonight, along with Dr. Vera Tarman. Now, before the break, um, I had asked the question of how do you know when you've crossed over that line, and, and Anne gave her take on it. Dr. Tarman, I was wondering whether or not you might like to uh, delve into the conversation as well mm -hmm. about that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because so many people want to know what's the difference between somebody who is a problem drinker versus an alcoholic, and what is that line? And, and uh, first of all, that line can, is different for everybody, but I, one of the crucial pieces is what Anne said, what, which was she made a, a, a commitment to herself about how much she was going to drink, and she couldn't keep it. Keep it. And, and uh, it, it's the whole idea that you can, you've lost control, you've lost your ability to manage. Uh, a problem drinker, when they have a problem, recognizes the problem and, it and if, uh, made the decision to stop, they can stop. Uh, and they may pick up again, but they can stop. The, the alcohol, the person who's gone over the line, can no longer stop. I mean, it's really, it's, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. In reading Anne's book, um, what jumps out at you as some of the, if I can put you on the spot, uh, what, what was it that you really liked about the book? What spoke to you? I think the piece that I found really intriguing was um, the bit about the young women and the alcohol industry, the whole idea that, I love that line when you said um, the alcohol industry recognized an underserved population, mm -hmm. young women. Uh, I was like, oh my God, yes. Uh, because I know when I was a young woman, um, drinking was considered kind of crass, you know, that was the, 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 the crass. Um, you did it, but you didn't really, you did it in private. Uh, but now we've made it very fashionable. Now we, uh, society has made it very fashionable. And that's, that's, that's a new trend that I, I, I think Anne has really exposed really nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to go to our toll-free lines. They are now open. Now we'd like for you to join in on the conversation. So please do. As always, any of you that may have a general question. Dr. Tarman is all, always very good about that. So if you, if you are struggling with, with something other than alcohol, maybe alcohol is, is with the, the problem that perhaps maybe you're on pain medication. We've had a lot of phone calls about opiates. It's okay. You can still pick up the phone tonight and call in because we're always here for those general questions. But tonight we are uh, especially talking about alcohol and the effect on society for both men and women. But Anne's about to tell us a, a few things uh, that, that women do need to uh, realize of what's been going on, and there have been changes afoot. But our first uh, phone call is in, so let's go to our toll-free lines. Line one, let's go to Tyreek, who's calling in from Ottawa tonight. Hello, Tyreek. Yeah, how y'all ladies are doing tonight? We're doing well. How are you? Um, I'm okay. I just had a question about um, about my uncle. Mm -hmm. he, he battles alcohol and some days he's saying, um, Oh, Tyreek. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, you're not feeling very well tonight. Uh, he was asking about his uncle, obviously a very painful subject for him to tackle. Um, as it is, you know, I, I really commend everybody for always picking up the phone and calling in to us. We're here mm -hmm. for you. So, Tyreek, uh, I'm really hopeful that uh, you can get through the pain that obviously you're in right now. And um, if we can offer any other help, perhaps you would like to call back in. We do have resources for you, and we can uh, help you find uh, maybe the resources that you need, perhaps for yourself and also for your uncle. Tonight we're talking to Anne Dowsett Johnson and Dr. Vera Tarman. Um, as we, we talk about um, you know, her new book called Drink, it is the intimate relationship between women and alcohol. Uh, we were talking before we took Tyreek's call that um, you know that it was uh, the, the, the alcohol distributors are really going after the younger generation, mm -hmm. and you made a, a, a very um, valid point. Um, walking in and seeing like in an LCBO all the pink drinks, so the rosés right. mm -hmm. and the and the. Um, the vodka coolers right. and that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. There's a, there's a um, thing that's known not so much in Canada, but we have them called Alka Pops. So think mm -hmm. Mike's Alka Hard Pops. Lemonade and uh, Smirnoff Ice, mm -hmm. and those are starter drinks or cocktails with training wheels. Um, <laughs> chick beer. Um, very focused on bringing the young woman into the market, um, steering her towards vodka, towards rum so that when she matures and gets to university, she's doing shots. 
she's doing tequila, she's doing vodka, um, if she's playing drinking games at university on campus, mm -hmm. her boyfriend's drinking beer, she's two-thirds his size, she probably hasn't eaten, mm -hmm. she's doing shots. And very, very dangerous, very mm -hmm. dangerous behavior. We all know that alcohol is the number one date rape drug. Um, this is not where it was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. um, she then graduates from university and she does not slow down. Mm -hmm. um, in previous generations, she did. She slowed down in her late 20s, not slowing down now or in her 20s, her 30s, her 40s, or her 50s. So really with men plateauing or dipping a little bit in terms of consumption, women are going straight up and mm -hmm. it's confounding uh, epidemiologists right around the world. What is happening? And the more professional, more educated the woman, the more likely she is to drink. Obviously you've researched this. What, what, are, what are they saying? What are some of the stats and why are we seeing more women um, drinking? Well, we're just, um, some of it's entitlement, some of it is I work like a man, I can drink like a man, that's part of it. Some of it's self-medication, women are 40% more likely to suffer from depression. It's our favorite drug, um, favorite legal drug and easy to get, easy to numb. Um, so that's number two. Number three, the question I ask is, has it become the modern woman's steroid? Is this the way women, as I did, come home from a long day at work, chop vegetables, oversee some homework, get ready for the next shift of work, which is, you know, your home life, and very common to have a glass of wine while you're doing that. Uh, we all know alcohol problems are progressive. They're marked by denial, so not that hard to say having a drink. Now I'm having two drinks, and uh, what for me f for years was two drinks at maximum, and many nights nothing, then changed, as I say, in a time of trouble into three and four. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to our phone lines now. Right. On the line from Burlington tonight, on line three is Maggie. Maggie, thank you very much for calling in tonight. Have you got a question or a comment for my panelists? Well, I have uh, some words of encouragement, mm. um, and they are some quotes from the 1800s, and they are, mistakes will happen in the best regulated families. The one and only serious mistake is to be afraid of making one. And we learn by our mistakes, we profit by mistakes, and a winner never quits and a quitter never wins. And when you talked about society and about, um, and I was thinking of Ford and his situation, mm -hmm. I just think it's pretty sad that everybody, like I don't know him and people are judging him by what they hear. And I just want to encourage that, hey, never, how do I say, quit in a difficult situation. You can get through it, whatever it be. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you did bring up the, the troubles of Mayor Rob Ford. We discussed it at length last week, um, and we thought that perhaps we would be talking about it tonight. So, Maggie, thank you very much. I mean, it, it's out there. He, somebody said he's the most famous mayor in the world right now for mm. his troubles. I turned on Saturday Night Live last night, and they mm. were parodying him right off the top. So, you know, it's, it's, he's on all the late-night talk shows, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of questions being raised out there. Um, Dr. Tarman, uh, your thoughts? on on what uh, Mayor Rob Ford's been going through? Well, I, the, the first thing that I think about is um, the, the nightmare that people have of I wake up with myself exposed, naked, and everybody's watching me. Mm -hmm. That must be how he feels. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the public humiliation, that's what I think of. Um, and, and then I think, you know, we were talking about bottoms. Like, that, what a bottom that must be. Um, that it... it I, I don't know. I, I just think this is an example of somebody who, um, in a very public way, we get to see what where addiction will bring a person. But that has not been proved. No. Everybody has their opinion. Yes. He says that he is not, and we, we need to respect that. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, he has admitted to some pretty wild behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, but the, the other thing is, is uh, I mean, I, I, of course I don't know Rob Ford myself. I, I, the only thing I can say is, he, he represents the profile of somebody for sure, 
Um, and you know, the hallmark feature about addiction is denial, and, and we're seeing that too. So I don't know if that speaks for him specifically, but certainly that is the profile. Mm -hmm. It is something, you know, here you are, you've got your best-selling book now, and it's just come out, and then all of this uh, breaks mm -hmm. loose right. right in your own backyard. Right. I, it's, uh, it's quite prevalent for what you're talking about, isn't it? Right. Yeah, I've been doing a fair amount of, of media, and there, there's um, something that I have brought up, which is compassion. I have enormous compassion for him mm -hmm. because he is so solidly in the throes of something so uncomfortable. and mm -hmm. uh, It's uncomfortable for us to watch. It is, and mm -hmm. it's devolving so quickly mm -hmm. and, and so sadly. And I think all of us think about the children. Yeah. Mm. Um, they're only six and eight, and, and it is really a remarkable. That's, that's what I think about. I think it's really quite... Uh, uh, sad, tragic. I, I'm so glad you brought up uh, compassion, as did Maggie, who just called in. Um, being compassionate for somebody who's going through troubles, and he's admitted he is going through troubles. Um, you know, I made reference to the late night talk shows. There was uh, John Stewart from The Daily Show, and, and I said it in last week's show. He said something very profound. Um, of course, they all had their fun at Toronto's expense and Mayor Rob Ford's expense. And then he turned to the camera and he looked right in and he said, You know, Mayor Rob Ford is an awful lot of fun to make fun of, but he will not be fun to eulogize. Mm. And, you know, that, that brought it all back into focus mm. uh, that we're dealing with a human being here. And, and I know that last week, when everybody was calling in, there was a lot of compassion for what Mayor Ford's going through. Not a lot of compassion for the media, mm. rightfully, wrongfully, but uh, you know, a lot of compassion for Mayor Ford. I'm reminded b about a wonderful segment, I don't know if either of you have seen it, um, by Craig Ferguson, who's himself in recovery, right. who years ago uh, said, he apologized for the fun he had made of uh, Britney Spears and said, I'm not going to do it anymore. This is somebody who's in terrible mm. trouble. And I'm reminded a lot of, of his comments. And I think that um, it isn't any laughing matter. This is, this is really, really tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Well, there's uh, some, some thoughts on what's currently going on in the city of Toronto and really right around the world. Um, so anyway, if you folks have any more comments on, on what's been happening with our mayor, your thoughts, as well as uh, we are talking tonight about the effects of alcohol and the journey to recovery and Ann Dowsett Johnson's best-selling book called Drink, An Intimate Relationship Between Women and Alcohol. And she's uh, brought some very sobering facts to the table today. So we're going to continue to examine this, and we're going to welcome more of your phone calls, along with Dr. Vera Tarman, after this very short break. We'll be right back. It's scary to think that you're going to live the rest of your life without drugs and alcohol when it's all you've depended on. But there is hope. I knew I couldn't do it alone, and treatment allowed me the chance to ask for the help that I needed in order to believe that I could live a sober life. I got the help and support that I needed, and even now that I've left, I still have that support there. Hello, I'm Ellen Campbell, the CEO and founder of the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness. As a charity, we depend on viewers such as yourself to support the programs for First Nations, women and children, anti-bullying, and elder abuse. I invite you to visit our website, see what you can do to share. Any donation over $20 will receive a tax receipt. Thank you so much for all your support. Welcome back to Living Clean, Living Well, everybody. Dr. Vera Tarman, along with Anne Dowsett Johnson. She's an author of the new book, the best-selling book that's out right now, Drink, The Intimate Relationship Between Women and Alcohol. I've got that title out a lot tonight for you, haven't You're I? You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> we would just like to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping, housekeeping matters here. Uh, Dr. Tarman is going to be speaking in uh, how, how long? Is it next week or two weeks from now? It's next, it's, um, next Saturday. Next Saturday. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Tarman, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, I'm going to be talking about, um, um, I'm going to be talking about food addiction and biology of spirituality. So, at, at the University of Toronto, uh, next, sun, next Saturday, 
Um, the morning we'll be specifically talking about food addiction, uh, and then in the afternoon I'm going to be talking about uh, it, it's sort of it's a, it's a recovery lecture, but it's the biology of uh, spirituality. So both of them will be very public friendly, and uh, yeah, that's that's great. We've yeah. got the the contact information there mm -hmm. as well. You can go on addictionsunplugged.com, right? Yeah, and you can it's get a, ticket info. Uh, yeah, and just to say that it's uh, it's twenty five dollars for both uh, talks. Very reasonable. Yes, I think so. Yeah, and you're right on the UT campus. We saw it was at Wycliffe College. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay. And also, I'd like to tell you about uh, the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness, which is a presenting sponsor of this show. They are starting up with their 13 Days of Christmas. It is their campaign that they run every year. We're going to be starting on December the 1st on Q107 with John Derringer and Maureen Holloway and the Great Morning Team. Mm -hmm. So, folks, we hope that you could be a part of it again this year. Uh, we really do great work. And it is mostly because of all of you wonderful, all of you wonderful people's generosity. So the 13 days of Christmas coming to Q107 on December the 1st for 13 days. And we're going to have a little bit of fun with that and at the same time do some good. So tonight we've been talking to Anne about her new book. And have I mentioned the title enough? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it has, it's, it's, it's very, for lack of a better word, it's very sobering what, uh, you mm -hmm. know, some of the, the statistics and, and it, you know, you, it brings up a good point. You know, I, there's, I, I read a lot about it. Um, you know, my friends and I, we discuss it. Very long day, you come home, you're making dinner. And like you said, for those that have children and, you know, there's a glass of wine. Right. And sort of the behavior that may be okay on the weekends is sort of starting to creep its way into the Monday to Friday routines, right? Right. And, and there's fascinating stuff saying that if you were born after the Second World War, you were much more vulnerable than those uh, who preceded us. Hmm. Um, and th really, two things, two really important facts. Number one, the thing that will... Um, predict that you will have trouble with alcohol. Um, number one, more than genes, is childhood sexual abuse. That is, that is um, undeniable. And the thing that will protect you against that is a blue collar job. In, in fact, the, the professional uh, person, uh, female, is much more likely to drink. And that's the thing that's confounding. So mm -hmm. as women have outpaced men in the post-secondary uh, scene, gone toe-to-toe -to -toe in the workplace, all of a sudden we are really confounding uh, people as we, as we mature and um, get more sophisticated, we are drinking more. Something is really going wrong. And at the same time, we see, as we were talking about, a huge amount of pitching of marketing towards us, mm -hmm. pinking of the market. Um, and a very interesting and I think sinister kind of marketing aimed at young people, which is called pull marketing. Pull marketing means you're not sitting on your couch turning off your um, commercial. You're going to your computer, you're mm -hmm. looking up Facebook, you're looking at YouTube, you're looking at Twitter, and you are seeking out to be part of the community of, say, Smirnoff or Bacardi. Very, very different um, kind of advertising, alcohol advertising. Before you know it, that alcohol company is uh, messaging you on your iPhone, and you are in, it becomes a person for you. Mm -hmm. Very, very different kind of uh, marketing than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't too long ago, and mm -hmm. I, I remember this, I grew up in Calgary, and some of the old hotels, you would see men's entrance and women's entrance. Right. So, uh, hmm. Even back in the 60s, yes. in some areas, yes. women weren't drinking with men. No. Well, were they even allowed to go in at all? Jasper, Alberta, I remember the yeah. Athabasca Hotel <laughs> had a men's entrance. Yeah. I remember very well. Yeah. So you were saying before the Second World War, though, um, was it just because alcohol wasn't uh, as readily available? I mean, they also went through, what was it, prohibition and all the rest? It just wasn't there like it is now. Well, I think you think Mad Men days and what happened in the 60s mm -hmm. and the 70s and, and things. They drank things a lot about. on they that drank, show. They drank a lot on that show. Yeah, but you know what they did that was different? And this, this, this is your mother's story. Uh, we, uh, uh, from a physician point of view, we were prescribing Valium like candy. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we were prescribing it to women. I mean, it was mother's little helper. Right. The women didn't need alcohol. They had Valium. And so then when they mixed alcohol, oh, my God, that, that's a synergistic, powerful punch. 
but I mean, it was just uh, like, like candy. Mm -hmm. and, and now we don't do that anymore because we realize how, uh, how uh, fundamentally addictive Valium is. I mean, and, and basically, it, it's liquid alcohol, so it, it, it's, it's a perfect mix, mm -hmm. dangerous mix. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so women are looking to numb, so they're not getting their Valium right. from their doctors. So like in Mad Men, wife is taking Valium, man is drinking alcohol. Right. Alcohol was, very, um, uh, was considered very um, classy for the man, and the woman was just taking it, and, and was not considered classy for the woman, but she had her pills. Right. Yeah. No, it's That's true. That's the difference. It's true. And what I find going to, into treatment centers, talking to young people, is that uh, I'm a classic older woman um, alcoholic, female alcoholic, but mm. if you're speaking to, and you would know this, speaking to women in their mm -hmm. 20s, they're polysubstance, mm -hmm. and we're seeing, yep. again, a combination of benzos and alcohol. Yeah. So polysubstance is? Uh, many substances? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm a pure alcoholic, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm an anomaly, a dinosaur, if you will. Yeah, well, yeah and, and, uh, and actually what it is more now than it is benzos now, it's, it's alcohol and, and cocaine. Um, uh, or other drugs uh, like ecstasy, club drugs, other types of drugs. But it's absolutely true. In, in the young population, there's very few, few people who are only drinking alcohol, men or women. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've been, uh, I was just recently on a, a cruise. I had to go and, and speak mm -hmm. on it, and, and I was, uh, you know, waiting. I was, I was getting a pop, but uh, they were uh, pouring um, very large drinks with Red Bull. Mm. So very, that, very scary combination. Mm -hmm. Very big on university campuses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Red Bull has a huge uh, presence on Canadian campuses, and what it produces is a wide awake drunk. Mm -hmm. Very, very scary. Oh, wide awake drunk. A yeah. wide awake drunk. Mm -hmm. And it, this is a, a very popular mixture um, in the university community and really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, that's, it's so interesting because one of the uh, qualities about alcohol that saves people's lives is they fall asleep. They pass out. And, and then uh, you stop drinking. And you stop drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, um, it, traditionally what we've, what's happened in the past is people would do, use cocaine or something like that to stay awake and then you'd have the, the, the overdose. But now with this introduction to Red Bull, you don't even have to go that far. You get to be a, a, a regular member of society who doesn't take drugs, they take Red Bull. And Red Bull has the amount of caffeine in it, like fun, um, huge amounts of caffeine. Um, which is exactly what you're saying. So mm -hmm. you, you don't get that benefit of falling asleep, so then you end up drinking more. Mm -hmm. And you drink more to the point of blackout, uh, which is just certain, it's a 0.3, you have to have about 0.3 um, uh, uh, blood alcohol concentration to get a blackout. And 0.4, you're starting to get into coma. Like it's oh. not that much further. And we're talking about coma, like brain damage. Mm -hmm. Serious. Yeah, that's, that's pretty serious. serious. Yeah. yeah. Tonight we're talking to Dr. Vera Tarman and Ann Dowsett Johnson. And we'd like to talk to you too. Our toll free lines are open. Please feel free, pick up the phone, join the conversation. If you have a question, it doesn't have to be about alcohol. We are definitely talking about it tonight. But if you have any other questions as well, we would love to hear from you. As always, we always say that this show is a safe haven for you, it's a place where you can call in even anonymously as long as you just give a name that you'll respond to when we call on you on the, on the, uh, the show. And uh, you can call in anonymously and ask your question. Maybe you're a concerned parent. Maybe you're a concerned grandparent. Um, maybe you're the partner or a spouse of someone and, and you just need to ask a few questions. We're here. Maybe you're worried about prescription drugs. We can talk about that too. But tonight we are talking to uh, Anne and Dr. Tarman um, about alcohol. And, you know, I, I'm starting to wonder you know, I guess we've seen an escalation, especially for females, um, since the, you know, the, the 60s. We were talking about the show Mad Men. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, let's back up a bit to the 50s. Where were women as far as drinking back then? Were they? Well, there was, there was a, a very strong um, sense that women shouldn't drink. Mm -hmm. And we have still a, a huge hangover, um, maybe bad choice of words, mm -hmm. left over from that era where a man who drinks too much can still keep his masculinity. He may be seen as a bon vivant, but he mm -hmm. can keep his masculinity. A woman who drinks too much can't keep her femininity and she's seen as sloppy. Yeah. And there is a, a strong cultural 
um, pecking order and uh, mm -hmm. it goes like this. Um, we look down our noses at a woman who drinks too much, a mother who drinks too much even more so, and bottom is mm -hmm. a poor mother who's pregnant. Um, and these are, these are things we need to talk about um, very clearly. They, we, um, we have a very unusual situation um, from a scientific point of view where science has told women that it's okay to drink when they're pregnant, it's not okay to drink when they're pregnant, and maybe <laughs> it's okay when they're, to drink when they're pregnant. We have had some fascinating studies come out in recent years saying that indeed it was okay, and uh, women are getting mixed messages on all sorts of fronts about alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's cool, I mean, if John Belushi were alive today, he'd be female and he'd be in Bridesmaids Magazine. The new drunk is female, like Vodka Sam, who was arrested, uh, I don't know if you heard her story, but she was arrested with an enormous blood alcohol content when she tried to storm a campus football field mm -hmm. um, at Labor Day and was put in jail and wanted to have her BAC tattooed on her arm. Um, vodka Sam her blood alcohol level yeah BAC. tweeted uh, tweeted and she is very proud of her blood mm. alcohol level so um, mm. so much for the frat boy stereotype and she's right. now female mm -hmm. I was just wondering about that escalation uh, mm. we'll go back to that uh, let's go now back to our toll-free lines let's go to line one and calling in from St. George tonight is Ken hi Ken you're on the show go ahead the floor is yours Ken Hello? hi there Ken go ahead yes my question is this and when it comes down to um, uh, addictions, you get uh, tobacco addiction. Now, cigarette packages have warning labels on them, okay? Uh, now, that's uh, mandated by the government. My curiosity would be with this, why do we not have warning labels on alcohol bottom, bottles in the LCBO? Well, uh, I think yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Ken, they, they, there's a big conversation going on um, at the federal level right now about whether or not those should um, actually be put on bottles. They're talking about putting on labels that say how many servings are in a bottle mm. and that's passed, but warning labels have not passed. There's a big pushback um, from certain sectors. So that conversation is actually in play right now in Ottawa. Yeah. So glad you brought it up. Yeah, great, great. Uh, yeah, glad you brought it up, Ken. Did you want to follow up? Yeah, I, I think, I, I think uh, we should have labels such as that. Uh, we have graphic pictures on tobacco packages. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, graphic pat uh, labels on uh, several other items, uh, e even household cleaners where you could burn your hand. Mm -hmm. So why don't we have a graphic picture on, uh, to, on a liquor bottle that has possibly a fatality, an accident, uh, these things happen. It's a reality, the same as uh, a lung cancer or, mm -hmm. or uh, arteriosclerosis of the heart, you know? Yeah. Ken, very valid points tonight. I'm so glad that you brought it up. And as Anne said, it's in place. We'll have to see how this one does unfold. We're going to take another break here on Living Clean, Living Well. But when we come back, more of your phone calls and more from Dr. Tarman and from Anne Dowsett-Johnson. We'll be right back. It's scary to think that you're going to live the rest of your life without drugs and alcohol when it's all you've depended on. But there is hope. I knew I couldn't do it alone. And treatment allowed me the chance to ask for the help that I needed in order to believe that I could live a sober life. I got the help and support that I needed and even now that I've left, I still have that support there. Hello, I'm Ellen Campbell, the CEO and founder of the Canadian Center for Abuse Awareness. As a charity, we depend on viewers such as yourself to support the programs for First Nations, women and children, anti-bullying and elder abuse. I invite you to visit our website, see what you can do to share. Any donation over $20 will receive a tax receipt. Thank you so much for all your support. Statistics state that it is likely you know a victim of abuse. It could be a friend, a relative, a colleague. It could even be you. 
one in three girls and one in five boys will be sexually abused before they reach the age of 18. Please give them hope. Help us make it stop. Go to abusehurts.com and give to the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness. You're watching Living Clean, Living Well on this Sunday night on CTS. We're so glad to have you here. Just a quick shout out to our friends at Recovery Wire magazine. Mm. This is a great magazine. It features the writing of Dr. Vera Tarman, some fantastic articles in it. We would encourage you, if you would like your free copy, go to their website, recoverywiremagazine.com, and you can requ uh, request your free copy. So uh, just, uh, just another great resource for you. Let's go back to our toll-free lines. Uh, let's go to line four. Calling in from Hamilton tonight is Colin. Hi, Colin. You're live on our show, and you're talking to Anne and Dr. Tarman. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? We're doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I've actually, I used to, used to drink, actually. Um, I'm 35, and I quit for about 14 months now. And uh, the reason I quit was I'd, sometimes it would go okay, but sometimes I'd get in a little bit of trouble, you know. It wouldn't go all that good, or I'd drink too much. And my, I just had a question. Um, because you had a problem with alcohol in the past, does that mean you can never drink again, or...? That's a very good question. Dr. Tarman, do you want to start? Well, yeah, it, that's the question that is on everybody's mind who, who has a problem with drinking. Um, you, you really won't know until you have a drink and see if you can control it. Uh, I, I, I personally think that people have an intuitive sense somewhere inside of themselves, whether it's a dangerous thing or not, but um, uh, if you were able to stop, I, I, I guess I don't really know how to answer that question other than to say uh, you might, you might want to try and see. And if you can actually literally moderate your drinking uh, in the way that you were describing, I'm going to just have one drink or two drinks or just on Saturday, and you can actually keep to that, then yes, you can. But uh, if you find that you can't, and you keep slipping back and, and, and end up drinking to an old pattern that you wanted to avoid, then I would say no. Uh, generally speaking, we believe that once you've crossed the line into alcoholism, you can never go back, regardless of how long you've been sober. Mm -hmm. And did you want to follow up with anything? I would agree totally. I mean, I think that, that this disease lies to us, and mm -hmm. we um, listen to the lies, and the lies go like this. I've been sober for five years, and therefore I can probably drink. And I think it's a terrifying voice um, that, that speaks to you. And uh, that beckoning finger could beckon me, uh, speaking for myself, beckon me right over the edge into something quite terrifying. and. Uh, so I think it, it's incumbent upon all of us to know, as Dr. Tarman says, whether we can, um, we can pick up a drink or not. I'm not willing to test it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Colin, did you have a follow-up question, or does that help you? I don't know. That, that kind of helped. That kind of, you know, I think even after 14 months, the urge is still there. But, you know, I, I think I know that drinking caused a lot of damage and a lot of... You have a sense already in there. You, you know, like I do think that people know they just don't listen. Um, and, and, and also the other thing is, is that a person who doesn't have a problem drinking doesn't ha continue to have that urge. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another feature right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point. Colin, thank you very much for picking up the phone tonight and joining our discussion. Uh, we're talking to Ann Dowsett Johnson about her book, Drink. Um, you were talking about the fact that there, there is a, a, a large problem that women especially need to take note of. And before we were taking our, our caller, um, we were talking about the progression. And in the 50s, you were saying it was, it was thought that women should not drink at all. And there were, in fact, there was, as we were saying earlier, there was some establishments that women weren't even allowed into because there was alcohol. Then in the 60s, you brought up The Mad Men, you know, the te famous television show about from the advertising agency of the, of the early 60s where everybody's drinking and first thing in the morning and they're mm -hmm. all pouring drinks. Um, we're seeing women starting to drink there. And that's when, um, you know, I, I remember from, you know, growing up in the 60s and my, my parents, uh, you know, where I, was, I would watch them at parties and stuff and the women were drinking then, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering as we crossed into the 70s, right. it became cool, didn't it? Right, it became cool and 
You walk into any uh, social situation and the first thing you're going to be asked is red or white. Mm -hmm. We have um, a, a cultural um, situation where we, we believe that if you're sophisticated, you know your wines. If you're an adult, you know how to handle your liquor. Mm -hmm. If you aren't, don't handle your liquor, you, uh, well, you might just be drinking like the French or the Italian, um, or you're the rare drunk. Um, one point one and a half percent to two and a half percent of any population on the whole is an alcoholic that's a very very low um, percentage uh, it's the eighty percent of us who are over the age of fifteen who drink who get into trouble and who um, cause most visits to the emergency rooms etc cetera, etc cetera. that's called the French paradox mm -hmm. Let's go back now to our phone lines and calling in from London tonight is Paula. Let's go to line one and talk to Paula. Hello there, you're on our show. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to, to call in. Um, I'm a regular viewer of your show, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, Anne, that you're on this evening with Dr. Tarman. I actually have your book um, in London on hold to pick up tomorrow, so I'm, I'm so looking That's forward great. to reading it. And I just wanted to, to just share... Um, just one word, the, the um, person that took my call asked me to, to kind of sum up what was my comment. <laughs> I didn't know how to do that in, in a few words, but I guess my message is hope. Um, I heard you say, Anne, around when you were, were young um, in the 50s, um, the elephant in the room, you know, it just was not allowed to, to speak of this subject, mm -hmm. and uh, it certainly was an elephant in the room. And I certainly can identify that with that uh, growing up with an alcoholic myself, my father. Uh, and yet today, um, when you made the comment um, around your um, employer, um, you know, when you said, um, do you, they said, do you want a job? Um, if so, um, you know, mom's the word. So it's interesting that today, still, our society, it's that elephant in the room. And I think certainly with what's going on in Toronto right now is evident of that. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that. I agree with you. And um, and just to to say thank you for, for, for stepping forward and writing this book and, and being that example. And I know Dr. Tarman, when she spoke in Toronto at Recovery Day, she used the term champions, and, and I see you as one of those champions. <laughs> Thank and you, I guess Paula. my question, if I could ask, is when you made that decision after you went to rehab and you said you had gone in the States, what propelled you to say to yourself, no, I, I am going to speak out, I am going to write this book and, and really breach your anonymity, I'm just curious, and what supports did you have in place to make that happen? Well, well, it's so, what a great question. It's so interesting you mentioned the word hope, because my publisher said to me, um, what is it you want to do with this book? And I said, I want to instill hope in others, and hope that, hope that this um, demon can be uh, battled and overcome. And my... Um, wonderful agent gave me a little stone with the word hope written on it that I have beside my desk and, and kept it near me when I wrote the whole book so it's given me quite a little chill that you would mention hope and that's what it was about um, that we can come out that we can I hope um, be examples um, both myself and and the many women in my book examples of recovery examples saying that it isn't just a revolving door that there's actually a great life very difficult to go through recovery but I'm the most Anne I've ever been and I'm very grounded um, as a writer as a happy person and this is uh, this is life on the other side of addiction and it is really um, something to be hoped for so thank you so much for your comment mm -hmm. Dr. Charman uh, perhaps you'd like to address the stigma uh, question. You know, um, from what you've seen and all of your wonderful uh, work that you're doing in, mm -hmm. in helping people step into recovery, um, it, it, does that not shock you that there's still stigma out there? Yeah. That if you disclose that you have a disease, mm -hmm. which it is, mm -hmm. that there could be a stigma following you around and you may not have a job? Yeah, I know. I, 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 yes. It, 
especially for women, there's a real stigma around it. And, and you know, Paula mentioned the uh, Recovery Day, and that's why I think that something like Recovery Day is so important because, I mean, Anne, you know, you, you went through this addiction and you're on the other side of it, and we should be celebrating yeah. um, uh, that it's possible to, to be in recovery and that that's a great life. Uh, and, but instead, we're focusing on the uh, stigmatic aspect of addiction. But on the other side of that, there's, there's a tremendous thing that we can be talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Your thoughts on stigma? Well, I think, I think we tend to, um, one of the, the most um, uh, prominent solutions to addiction is AA. And we tend to be hidden in church basements. I think those of us um, in recovery um, or we uh, have another way of, of healing ourselves behind closed doors with therapists or meditation, Buddhism, uh, many options. But we haven't come out, as Dr. Tarman said, we haven't come out and said, this is what recovery looks like, this is what it smells like, I pay my taxes, I go to work, I'm fulfilled, this is what it looks like, it, and, and I am not touch wood stumbling. I think that um, Recovery Day is important. Um, the new Faces and Voices mm -hmm. of Recovery Canada, of which I'm one of the five steering uh, women, this is uh, a remarkable organization and I think going to help sustain a pan-Canadian initiative, help sustain a sense of what recovery looks like. Mm -hmm. But so far it's been hidden. It's been hidden and we haven't, we haven't uh, known what it looks like. We have stigmatized, we're totally other, an addictive person. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that rare alcoholic, it's that rare um, drunk driver, it's that rare mm -hmm. person under the bridge. It isn't me. Mm -hmm. And actually, it is me. This is what it looks like. And Anne, how can everybody, if they would like, get a copy of your book? Because Paula's quite excited that hers is coming tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, my book is available everywhere, um, all bookstores across Canada. It's available in ebook, it's available in audiobook, mm -hmm. and uh, in hardcover. Well done, you've got it all covered. And it's a bestseller. Dr. Tarman, tell me again about your talk that we've got coming up next week. You're going to be at Wycliffe College. You're going to be talking about food addiction first thing in the morning? That's right. I'm going to be talking about food addiction, uh, the, the, uh, the biology behind addiction and how food fits into that because so many of us don't see our sugar and our starch intake as addictive, so I'm going to talk about that. And I'm also going to talk about uh, the biology of addiction as well to kind of uh, show that there is some real physiology uh, behind uh, spirituality and, and why it is so healthy for us. Wonderful. Yeah. So go to addictionsunplugged.com and you can get some information on tickets there. And also, don't forget about our 13 Days of Christmas campaign in aid of the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness so they can keep doing all their wonderful work there. Uh, it's on Q107 and we'll be telling you a little bit more about that in the weeks to come. It's going to be starting up on December the 1st. So we're going to take our final break here on Living Clean, Living Well. But when we come back, we'll have some final thoughts from Dr. Tarman and Ann Dowsett Johnson. It's scary to think that you're going to live the rest of your life without drugs and alcohol when it's all you've depended on. But there is hope. I knew I couldn't do it alone. And treatment allowed me the chance to ask for the help that I needed in order to believe that I could live a sober life. I got the help and support that I needed and even now that I've left, I still have that support there. that time of the show when we ask for final thoughts and we'll give it to our wonderful guest tonight Ann Dobson Johnson you can start things off what what would you like to say I'd like to say that I think we're entering a new era of recovery where recovery is going to be the mm -hmm. focus um, I'm a champion of this and I think that uh, coming out with my book coming out with my story coming out with a sense of uh, peace and uh, vitality I believe that we are going to see something very different in Canada over the next five years, and I'm excited. And you're leading the charge. This is wonderful. 
And Dr. Tarman, some final thoughts from you. Well, I would just like to say um, uh, this is this book is worth reading. It's 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 a wonderful mix of a memoir and lots of statistical facts uh, as well, and uh, it really speaks uh, about that elephant uh, in a way that uh, it, it's good that we do and and. It opens up the whole idea about recovery is a very positive place to be. Well, I've truly yeah. enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much, thank Anne. You. Thank you again, Dr. Thank Tarman. You. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Don't forget, you can get Anne's best-selling book yourself. It's called Drink. I will be back with you next week. Have a good one, everyone. Living clean, living